Holtzius is a Holtzius is a Holtzius. Yeah. And, and if you want to learn about mannerism, here's your moment. That's right. Because that whole Parmesan, you know, let's stretch the body out and add some 16 packs and a whole bunch of extra muscles. By golly, Holtzius is your man. My name is Ann Schaefer, and I'm an independent curator specializing in prints and printmaking. I'm joined by True Ludwig, an artist, printmaker, and art historian who can engage a group of sleepy art students like nobody I have ever seen. It's, it's something else. You have found us at Plate Mark. We are on Series 2, in which we are bringing forward our version of Western visual culture in the most colloquial way we know how. Trust me, it's colloquial. Today we're talking about Hendrik Holtzius, or Hendrik Holtzius, depending on who you are who created my favorite engravings of all time. He did this crazy set of four prints of falling figures. Now, these guys are nude, like literally nude, falling in the sky. And there are these circular compositions. And for God's sake, you can see, you know, straight on up. So wait till we get there. You're, <laughs> you won't believe it. And even beyond the craziness that is the four disgracers, as they are known, he, he really did come up with this crazy and amazing style that I think you will really enjoy. But why should prints matter? Well, it seems to me that visual culture is the history of us and our humanity. And it is through prints and their multiplicity that ideas and images can be spread far and wide in the early parts of our modern history. So back in 16th century Europe, prints were really the way that people got information, visual information, and even just straight up information. I mean, they really were that era's internet, if you think about it. It is my contention that it's important for us to understand our history and to learn from it. And I think prints are an excellent way to get at not only the cultural side of our shared history, but also the politics and religious discourse that was occurring in this era. As we get rolling, please know that all of the images we talk about are over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. And also a note about the audio quality. I was just too far back from the mic through this entire episode, and I do apologize. So bear with us. I'm glad you've joined us in any case. Buckle up and let's get to it. One of my favorite engravers of all time. Should be. Yes. Hendrik Goltzius, or if you're from over there. I wouldn't say it right, but I'd still go Hendrik Goltzius. Goltzius. It's a good throat clearing name. It is. Yeah, you're in for a treat. Okay, let's do our positionality and then we'll get rolling. I identify as a cis hat white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I'm True Ludwig. I identify as a white male trans person who uses he, him as my favorite pronouns. All right. <laughs> We're recording this at the Purple Crayon Press in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Hendrik Holtzius. Hendrik Holtzius. I'm going to use the inimitable words of A. Hyatt Mayer, who I find to be a delightful writer on prints and printmaking, because he's still effusive back, in not the purple prose of the 19th century, but you can still tell that he's just writing with an actual person's voice, as opposed to you know, some of the erudite art historical jargon that you get later on. Yeah. But I enjoy the fact that A. Hyatt Mayer wrote that Goltzius was the last professional engraver who drew with the authority of a good painter and the last who invented many pictures for others to copy. Yeah. He, he, he was a printmaker who could really create great paintings, which he didn't do until after 1601. And, and yet he did prints as though he were a painter. He saw and, and made images with that same wonderful painterly essence, even though there's nothing about those engravings that looks painterly at all. No, and they have such a style to them. They're, you can pick one up well. Uh, you can. You totally can. No. Work after him, but... Yeah, a no. Holtzius is a Holtzius. A Holtzius is a Holtzius is a Holtzius. Yeah. And, and if you want to learn about mannerism, here's your moment. That's right. Because that whole Parmesan, you know, let's stretch the body out and add some 16 packs and a whole bunch of extra muscles and do interesting things with secondary sex characteristics. By golly, Holtzius is your man. He really does it in a great way. Holtzius, though, we refer to as Dutch. 
He's not, he was from the Netherlands, air quotes, but he's coming from that time of the, of the 16th century when the world was so fraught with warfare, religious warfare, turmoil, upside down, everything's nuts, 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 nuts. He grew up in a part of the Netherlands that becomes Dutch, but moves into Harlem, which is fully Dutch, in 1877. Now, Holtius was born in 1557, right about when Bruegel was making those first crazy, wonderful prints that we enjoyed. And he dies in 1617. He's about 58, 59 years old when he died. He gets almost 20 more years out of printmaking than, than our poor friend Bruegel. Holtius had a, a good life, but saying that he's Dutch is tremendously important because he's still definitely a product of the Reformation, Counter-Reformation dichotomy, the split, all of the bedlam that made the 16th century so apocalyptic, just in terms of how everything was a tumble, a warfare, everything. The Spanish were holding all of the Netherlands, the Low Countries, the Netherlands, under their control as a Catholic country under Philip II until there was the 80 Years' War or the Dutch War of Independence that started in about 1568 versus Philip II of Spain, who was also referred to as like one of the most Catholic of kings. And so was Philip IV. They, they, they had followed after Charles V had sacked Rome and said that Rome, he was going to get that Catholic Church back on course. The Catholic Counter-Reformation had begun in earnest about 1536. That's the same year that Michelangelo paints The Last Judgment. Mm. And it really is an indicator of just how wretchedly difficult everything can and would become. And the Catholic Counter-Reformation finally gets its act together with the Councils of Trent, and they figure out the Spanish Inquisition, which is a way of bringing people under control. And if you're heretical to the Catholic Church, then you're definitely going to be tortured and made to recant or die. So the term Counter-Reformation is really a euphemism, because... It's like the clamping down. Yeah. We mentioned in a prior episode, there's a more recent term that I've come across, which we now call the Catholic Reformation, Yeah, which better. is a way of the Catholic Church reforming after the Protestant Reformation. And those Protestants had broken off from the Catholic Church. So no matter how you slice it, it was one group responding to another group and trying to figure out their methods of preparing images and giving them to the population and what their functions should be. So we know that uh, Martin Luther had said there shouldn't be any outwardly religious imagery that you should learn from the Bible. Holtius is one of these artists that figures out how to use everything possible to create interesting images, which could be classical or they could be uplifting. Rarely it seems genre. Always, there's a lot of Italianate sources, a lot of Greco-Roman sources, and always his own unique skill and artistry. In this entire 80 years war, Holtius is a part of that. He's a child, he's what, 10 years old when that war begins, and his images are done as a response to and a way of breaking away in a, a wonderful way. So he, though, and his mentor moved to Harlem, which is a, one of the safer cities in the burgeoning Dutch area, the areas that are trying to break off from Spain, the seven provinces that would become what we now know as Holland. And he's working there in the 1580s. Flanders is the southern part of what had been called the United Provinces of the Netherlands. And that would be the 10 provinces that would go Spanish. And Holtius is up in the, the orange area here. It's everything, the House of Orange. Holtius <laughs> is up in this orange area, which would be the seven provinces that would become the Dutch Republic, a republic as in ruled by themselves. And that includes places like Harlem and Leiden and Amsterdam and Utrecht. And I'm showing Anne two images with my magic map. And one is a, an image of a hand and another is an image of a, a fellow carrying what appears to be a very large flag. Yeah. And I just want to see what Anne has to say about these two images. <laughs> uh, the image of the hand is, I, don't, I can't remember how big it is, but it's Holtius's hand, right? Yeah. Yep. And... It's remarkable because Holtius, as I recall, had an accident when he was young and his hand was mangled in a fire. He fell into a fire. Literally fell at the age of one, fell into oh, a fire so, and grasped the coals. Oh. And his hand was completely frozen into a certain position. He's drawn his hand, and this is actually, doesn't this look like an engraving? That's a drawing. drawing. And you can see in this drawing that he is using the nib of the pen, swelling and tapering as you would see him 
ultimately use the burin as he carves into a, a piece of copper. And you can see the way that he is doing the cross contours, the things that move across mm -hmm. the, the, the fingers so that they have a three-dimensional presence. So rather than just saying mangled, tell me a little bit more about the way you see this hand. The things that are remarkable to me are the knuckles and the vein. Like he's drawn everything in high relief. Mm -hmm. And every moment that there's some little marring of a lump or a bump is exaggerated to me. Absolutely. Yeah. And it shows that his middle finger is basically the only one on his, on the four digits that's straight. The mm -hmm. other ones are curled in, looks like. Mm -hmm. And his thumb is a little bit curled. I mean, my it looks like distended. Those fingers are definitely not standard issue. And the thing that's also really remarkable is just by noticing the way the tendons on the back of the hand are visible. Mm -hmm and the knuckles are really prominent, but you can even almost see the heads of the bones there. Yeah. And then the way the vein is dancing across the back of the hand. And what I say to my students is like, when you look at your grandmother's hands and mm -hmm. that, that thin papery skin, and you can see the blue vessels moving around under the, he nails that. He absolutely captures that sense of the big old veins going across the back of his hand. And yet it's not a weak hand by any stretch. It's muscular, it's powerful. And you even have a sense of the, of the cuff there. And see the, H, the HG, the Henry Holtius, the monogram yeah. there. And then the, the Z becomes this lovely flourish. Mm -hmm. And then Fachit made this in the year with this lovely little, 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 little flourish off the Anno. Graphic A. Yes, in 1588. And then little, little, because it's just this showmanship of penmanship. If you'd been Bruegel or some others, not Durer, of course, but you would have been able to hand that off to an engraver and say, I want you to make me this. Right. But Holtius already knew all of those things. And he was already creating, in a way he had made himself. Holtius made this. Mm -hmm. And it's as though this hand is the, is the thing that holds the burin. One person said, oh, I love this, this is also Mayer. He said, uh, Holtius had a malformed right hand from a fire when he was a baby, which turned out to be essentially, this is, I've never heard it this way, which it turned out to be essentially well suited to holding the burin, quote, by being forced to draw with the large muscles of his arm and shoulder, he mastered a commanding swing of line, hmm. end quote. Now, Anne has seen me teach drawing, and I know how I talk about drawing from the shoulder, not I'm fussy and from the wrist. By understanding that concept of how it's the mark, when you're engraving, it's not just pushing something with the hands. It is indeed an entire whole movement. Body, yeah. The whole body, the strength has to come through, down through the arm, and your ability to turn, rotate the plate into the tool. There's a whole strength without tension and yet control that has to happen to be able to make that. And there's something about this that says, though, Holtius made this. I can make this drawing this beautiful, and I'm going to make these prints this great. And I use this often with my students to saying, when you think it's hard, guess what? It was hard for that guy. It was hard for Beethoven to compose deaf. Right. It was hard for Goya to survive his life deaf from 1792 until he died. He was deaf, like Beethoven. It's not a because of, it's an in spite of. There's various things that Holtius managed to excel at doing. So I just, I love the fact that right off the bat, he's already in a way kind of an underdog who's going to prove himself. Hmm. I feel like there's definitely a conception late, maybe later on, and I wonder if it's true with Holtzius, about the create the creation that comes out of an artist's hand being God-given. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, and it's all generated, you know, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. a by up to down the arm, down through mm -hmm. the hand, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We think we're... Think, that? I, I think that there's got to be some of that in there. I also see a patriot. I see someone who is fiercely independent on purpose. He's living in Harlem, which eventually will become, it's, it's really close to Amsterdam. The, it's essentially the seat of what will eventually become Protestant. They won't be free from Spain officially until 1648. But all of those pictures we see of militias and the mustering of the troops and all of those that you see in paintings in the 17th century are literally groups of people that are protecting their city from invaders, much like the Ukrainians protecting their city from invaders, people that want to squash their freedom. And I see this guy, Holtius, as living in a time when the Spanish are everywhere, and yet he fiercely believes in what he's going to do. And so the very first image I'm, I'm giving us is this image of the standard bearer, and it's a, 
a guy in Northern Renaissance apparel carrying a flag. I'm carrying it. That's an understatement. Wouldn't you say? It's a, he's, what is he? He's brandishing. He's waving. It's, 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 it's the flag that he's leading with is as huge as like a Denny's American flag. It's a huge well, flag. Look at the pole. There's no way he could. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the strength of that pole. Yeah. And, and and yet it's let's, too short. Like you couldn't possibly hold that much that weight. Much weight in fabric with that tiny little pole. <laughs> but, but if you look at that tiny little pole and how it lines up with his leg, and you yeah, look yeah. at this gorgeous composition, sure. there's something else about Holtzius, which is he's such a beautiful product of international mannerism. Why don't you tell our friends a little bit more about this fellow's holding the short pole? What else do you notice about our fellow? <laughs> It's not clear that he's, I don't think he's marching and leading a crew, but he's all twisted as though he's in motion. Mm -hmm. And he's got a hand on a hip, and I'm not sure the skeletal works quite Well, I'd say that, I just like that whole magnificent, huge, bulky jacket is, it's almost functioning as a codpiece, if you will. And, And he's got these magnificent, strong calves down to these little tiny feet and his, his lovely head which is turning backwards to quite possibly the group that he's leading is also very small which is consistent with virtually every mannerist figure you'll see such as parmigianino long long necks and long fingers and long legs and just this amazing sinuous kind of serpentine quality and, and he's and he's just so flamboyant he also has that big collar the big ruffed collar rough. which, that is actually spanish that collar that everyone was wearing in the north was part of the spanish court and one of the reasons you see that was because that was a spanish type and and the very dark clothing that everybody wore was as all an extension of the the very serious clothing that people wore in spain it was very dark and yes. understated yeah. Which I find fascinating, although there's all kinds of be- beautiful fufara stitched to it. But the rough, I, don't, I have never quite understood the rough and its purpose. It, well, you know how, let's talk about fingernails and stanchions and making them pretty colors. That they have absolutely no goddamn function. In fact, they're functionless. Right. In this case, it's high fashion, and that's another thing about mannerism. But now let's take a look at what's behind our standard bearer. And... Think about what he's showing you there. It looks like soldiers are practicing combat. It mm-hmm. doesn't look, like, for whatever reason, it doesn't look like actual combat. Mm-hmm. It looks like people are doing military exercise sort of thing. And then there's a city behind, way, way in the back. In the back. Yep. This is an engraving, not an etching. And that's also impressive, too, when you realize that the deeper the mark, the more ink it'll hold. Oh, I see. So let's think about... Already at this moment, we're talking 1587, so Holtius is maybe 30 years old, and his command of the Biren already at being able to go from absolute dark to, if you were a musician, that would be 333P, pianississimo. Yeah. You know, all the it's way like back. It's a light first hit on an etching, but it's gr- It's engraved. engraving. It's engraved. And, and also just lovely little vignettes like that wedge of geese that is flying backwards. Right. It's taking our eye back to the corner, which is a gorgeous composition. Right out of this oh, isn't that interesting? How nice. <laughs> Good shot, Anne. <laughs> Anne is usually re- reticent to well, mention. Well, it also follows along the sword. Mm-hmm. And, and the troops are like, ooh, and it takes us. And, and you notice there are no fakie mountains or anything. This is definitely the low countries. Right. It is the nether flat lands. Yeah. Right? Remember, they had to save or win their country back from the sea by putting in dikes and keeping the sea from eating into it. And then when they did, they had windmills that would pump water away and creating all of those canals to manage water. This is a, a, a group of people who eventually would be so proud of place that they had managed to best the Spanish huge 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 machinery larger by far than this tiny little blip of culture on the north sea and versus the weather worth versus time versus all of these different kinds of things to become in another 70 years the the most dynamic well we have new amsterdam we have new york because of the dutch i see holtius as a leader on this and in the bottom of this engraving it says when the standard bearer advances the troops advance and when he flees they die 
So it's the importance of somebody being at the lead, the avant-garde, the, the scout, the one that will, it's as though all of the people of that country, of that area, need to be ready and be the standard bearers of their own time and place, which I think is remarkable. And yet it's the most elegant kind of a print you would expect from a war zone, because that is in fact Harlem at the very back. Oh. Which, if you've been there, have you been to Harlem? I have not. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. That's where Hans, Franz Hals um, hailed from. It's a neighbor to Amsterdam, and it's a great, beautiful cultural city. It's preserved in time in its own mm. lovely, special right. way. So he has this flashy military costume. He's that. There's the military camp around behind him, the city of Harlem, and what it is, this incredible patriotism that we see from J Jump Street with this engraver. And this is fairly early. Now, we're going to see a whole lot of his work from the 1580s and the 1590s. Look at that ridiculous flourish with that <laughs> hand that is engraved into a plate. And he is the consummate mannerist, Netherlandish engraver out there in printmaking. I mean, I think uh, Mayer didn't really say it, but isn't there the thought that because his hand was so scar tissued and it held stuck it. that... It was, he didn't feel the pain, basically. Yeah, and he, and it went away. It's like, it's stuck in that position. So yes, I think of him as a Django Reinhardt of engraving. Yeah. Listening to Django Reinhardt and looking at him playing with two fingers right. and what he can accomplish and the speed and, and the virtuosity. It's, it's an almost, yeah, it's a because of, not in spite of. It's like, I can do this, watch this. So his technical skill is beyond reproach. We only get to see him as an engraver here for 20 years, but then all of a sudden he's going to stop. I find that fascinating. Like, what the heck happened? Yeah, I know. But so here's Holtius believing that his town, his country, will win against the Spanish. So we have this mastery of things, but he is a perfect example of a reproductive printmaker because he does many engravings after designs by other artists. And I'm showing Anne one that the students always got a huge kick out of, which was he engraved in 1585, which was done, believe it or not, after a wash drawing. Oh. Which, to me, I don't, if you softened your gaze, you might be able to see the washiness of it. But all I can see is the excellence of Holtius's marks. <laughs> a wash drawing of Judith with the head of Holofernes. And it was done after a wash drawing by Bartholomus Sprenger. Yes. And, and what you can see in this early one, though, is Holtius already working out his M.O. as an engraver. What do you see? That you that makes you love him. <laughs> I I mean I'm always fascinated by the the vocabulary of patterns that he develops in order to create flesh or hair or fabric or metal or or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this one is just it's tiny, it's round, and there's text going all the way around the outside of it. And it is a tiny image. It's small, and she is there. Bare-breasted, I'm not exactly sure what that garment is doing. Yeah, it doesn't need to be on there. It doesn't really matter. And Just, she's yeah. holding up the head of Holofanners, whose body is still in bed. Which is so cool, because if you look at it, you know, here's Judith, like, holding this head, grasping it by its hair. Some grisly old dude. And she's still holding the sword in her other hand, which, if you notice, is a right hand, and it's weirdly mangled. It looks a lot like Holtz's hand. And it's also broken out of the sphere. It's the one yeah. thing that's broken the box, or well, the circle, the tondo, right? Judith was a Jewish widow who had her people, her Jewish compatriots were being held captive by uh, Holofernes, who was an Assyri Assyrian commander. And she finally like, had enough, and so she's going to figure out a way to get him to let her people go. So she gets all prettied up and she goes in there and has dinner with them and says she has some information and they have a little dinner and they have a little drink and he has, helps him have a little bit more to drink, a little bit more, and eventually gets him <laughs> horny enough that he's sort of lost the fact that she's whoop, whap, takes his head off and she's holding his head up and with that head, she takes it back and the people all say, oh, wow. And, and, and all of the, the, the Assyrians are like, oh, my God. And they're pet because their commander's toast. And it's interesting. Look at this. How in this, this wonderful com composition, how Sprenger, now remember, he's the guy that designed it, but how the head is being held just off of where it had been severed from. So it almost completes the body, but the dead arm is like, Pfft. look at that. Every hand in every Holtius engraving is always going to be like at maximal. Yeah, you got to check out the hands and everything. Always. Because, boy, I can tell you, that young lady's hand is like... Well, the way she's, she's holding the head up 
pretty high, and it's almost like they're having a conversation. And very good. And look how strong she's. Strong. She's strong. And we know why she's strong, because this is definitely a mannerist kind of an image. Even for a woman who's got the most beautiful conical breasts of all time. In my day, we have, would have called those like a 1950s bra. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cadillac bumper bullets. <laughs> They're perfectly formed cones with really prominent nips. And great torso. Nice little tucked in navel there. And then the drapery is all, you know, it's just... It's stunning, but a small head, long limbs, that kind of oh, worried-looking face. Yeah. It's a fabulous composition, though. You know, that gorgeous diagonal going across, which also helps to sever the head from how she's holding it. And then this is absurd. This gorgeous script in an italic font all around the side of it that tells us exactly what she's doing. It is just the epitome of mannerism. It's arcane, it's beautiful, it's strange, it's fashionable in its own right and that's the kind of thing that well, it carries a lesson too oh you better believe it like don't hold my people mm-hmm. captive let my people go Whomp. All right. works for me there it is it's just it's so splendid so that's from about 1585 and and that yes it's by you know it's it's after Bartholomew Springer but Holtius engraves it and that just gives us a clue that Holtius can almost take anything by any artist and and make it his own it, it shows him that he is becomes the pinnacle of, of engraving in the North. And the other question about why would he be doing all of these? Well, by the 1580s, 1590s, the, the clientele for prints, like those that had been fostered, let's say, by Hieronymus Koch and, and his crew, was that there was uh, this idea of collectors and people that started recognizing artists by their names and collecting because, oh, it's a Holtius engraving. Those are the kinds of people that would be creating their own Kunstkammer, their own art collection. They were augmenting those with art. They knew the names of Albrecht Dürer. They knew the names of Lucas van Leyden. And, and so this was how Holtius made his fame, was on his prints. And when you said that he ter- takes, he can take anything and make it into this thing, but to me, he, the style of the ingrid, and some of it is taste and what you like oh totally absolutely i really appreciate the graphic nature of them and the crispness and all of that when you say graphic nature talk to be more specific please i think that for me the graphicness is not only the lights and darks that make everything clear but that that the characterization of the figures is it's always I don't know, they're just so present, and they're modeled, and they're so... Like, they're sculptural. They're not outlines. Clear. Yeah, they're, these are sculptural. They're yeah. three-dimensional beings, particularly in the one that Anne's looking at right now, which was always right. a phenomenal hit for our <laughs> students. <laughs> This one, which this is Hercules. The companions of Cadmus devoured by a dragon. I'm oh, sorry, not Hercules. Yeah, well, but you might, you might, well, it's still, because it's got the, yeah. <laughs> it's the companions of Cadmus devoured by a dragon. This comes from 1588, and it was actually, I hate having to try to say it, after Cornelius Cornelius. Yes, that was the guy's name. Like Dave, Dave, mm-hmm. Ben, Ben. Bill Williams. Yeah. <laughs> so here's Cornelius Cornelius was the artist and hands this off to our buddy Holtius. Now, Tell me more about the graphic nature of this Companions of Cadmus Devoured by Lane. What do you recall the students enjoying most about this? Well, the composition is kind of nutso, and it, and it takes a while to, to figure out what body parts belong to <laughs> Sorry. <whom. laughs> There's a man reclining who's leaning on one elbow, and his hand is tucked behind his back in a very uncomfortable sort of manner. It's sort of Holtius yeah, positioning Holtius hand. hand. Yeah. And his right hand is ho- holding the neck of a dragon that's got him by the face. face. He's like biting his face off. Biting his face off. And then uh, laying across the man's lap is the, the bottom part of another body. Yeah. And then the head of that person, I think, yeah. is tucked under his, his tuchus there. Yeah, so you see magnificent back, beautiful arm going, no, don't eat my face, and the dragon's... <coughs> all Mr. Universes. Right, totally, yeah. It, 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 Mr. F- to the end of time versus. <laughs> and then this other guy with this phenomenal backside and a great thigh and these really bumpy knees and his foot an amazing foreshortening right down towards mm-hmm. us. But the, I think the thing... It takes the students a while to pick this apart. Yeah. But yeah, the head that's been literally ripped off of the guy, I, let's presume it's the guy that's laying across the other man. It's the stub of his spinal column and some various parts that are squirting little remains of blood. Yeah. Okay, there's definitely stuff that got ripped off. It's not just an even smooth ham shape. Yeah. It's been shredded off. 
And then, oh, look. Looking up his nose. We totally are looking. It was great for And he doesn't look real, you know. Yeah. And then what do you think? Maybe is that a femur, perhaps? And yeah. then a skull of something? And another head is over here. Yeah. And then these, it took takes a while to realize that there are two feet of this dragon that are clamping. One set is clamping onto the thigh of the guy. And the other set is clamping onto the chest of the one that's across our supposed hero's lap. But the placement of those claws makes it look like dribbling boobs. Yes. And <laughs> don't they though? They but I do. but you come to realize, oh wait, those are the claws going the claws. into the flesh. And then there's this wildly muscular dragon biting the face off of the poor guy and the snaky snaky tails coming off and do you suppose that's another arm of another guy over there? I think that's, isn't that ending with a claw down at the bottom? Oh, is that a leg? The then it's wrapping its tail around its own. See, yeah. but isn't this, are you folks having fun watching us s- working at this <laughs> through? figure out what's going on. So all of this is in the immediate foreground, and then there's some poor little slob that's like ah! trying to run away in the top left corner behind a tree. And then in the middle ground, there's another piece of landscape. And in the in the closing in a distant far ground, there's something else that's going to be, and maybe it's another episode where it's oh. somebody's going to get attacked. All right, so that's graphic. Plus great wings, it's right? Like Marvel. They, they do, but better, right? Because mm-hmm. Marvel Comics doesn't add this many extra muscles. That's True. You can always count on Holtzius to give you plenty. So the companions of Cadmus, and I think of this image as weird as it is, to think, I think of Paul Cadmus and the way that yeah. it draws, because oh, sure. in the same kind of crosshatchy yeah. weirdness. But also that it's the companions of a person who's not in the picture. Like, yeah. What is up with, I don't think it named. Okay, so here's the story, <laughs> and this is where Anna's rolls her eyes, and well, what the hell, but I had to look it up to know what this was about. So Cadmus is the legendary founder of Thebes, that great ancient city in Greece, okay? So Cadmus... And you're going to love this, Anne. Cadmus was led by a cow, so said the oracle, to Thebes before it existed. And he sends his companions to a spring to get some water. That's why there's a water urn in here somewhere. All of these are killed by a great snake or dragon, and there's a battle. And eventually, because Athena says to him, or excuse me now, Minerva, because it's Roman, Minerva, his, his protectress, says, okay, when you slay that dragon, you take the the teeth, and wherever those teeth of the dragon that you slew are planted, up will grow fully armed men that will help you found the city of Thebes. Huh? Huh? Come on, it's that it's makes it, sense. it's in the book, of course. It's the magic beans, okay. It's the magic Roman beans. Mm-hmm. You gotta have Roman beans. You start a yeah. city of Thebes. Yay! Courage. Slay the evil dragon. Take its teeth. Plant it. You'll be able to win over the Spanish. No problem. Hmm. Sure. Okay. Now, I just want you to... Oh, the dragon has Spain. Got it. Sure. Got it. It's really an elegant death scene. The students adored this. Can you remember how they'd hoot and hoot and hoot about this? Yeah. There were a couple really wonderful remakes of this for the final project. Right. Uh, just wonderful. Either way, it tells us an important story about the, the founding of an important city in ancient Greece that was written by some Romans, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Which is under attack by an evil dragon named Spain. Yeah, pretty right. much. Got it. Yeah. Okay, now the next one, also a lovely engraving. This one's big. Yeah, way big. Really big. It's, remember how big, how big, you, how big was it? How big is it? I mean, it's... I think it's almost, it's like 24. It's, it's big. It's big-ass copper yeah. plate. And this comes from 1589, the Great Hercules. Now, this to me looks like it must have been the model that every mannerist used for their anatomy class. <laughs> Now, let's remember that Hercules is that great hero who had 12 labors to perform and semi-divine. And we know that many rulers in the 16th century wanted to pretend that they were Hercules and they were virtuous. And remember what one of Hercules' attributes was? How do we recognize Hercules? It's a lion skin. Yeah, look at that cool thing that he's wearing on his head. What is it? Oh, it's the lion's head. Yeah, and then it's all the rest of the lion skin. Blah, 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 hanging yeah, down behind him. Down. And he's got a nice big clubby staffy thing. And he's got a Holtzius hand. Oh, my God. It's the, Yeah. He has a Holtzius everything, if you really look at it. Because <laughs> those feet are fairly intensely short, short and too. Yeah. And, and then, oh my God, those knees. I hope these guys never had knee problems, because holy moly, every little fascia, tendon, blah, 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 is there. Yeah, he's and, naked except for that lion skin, so that you can see every muscle, and, and he's got a 20-pack. It, it has a 20-pack, and he has this face of a guy I might see in a 
German pub. Look at that marvelous handlebar mustache. A sort of worried expression. There's a whole background, a wonderful, vivid scene behind him with him slaying the Nemean lion and doing a couple other of his little things. But he's right here in front of us. He looks like the head of some guy from down in Harlem at the pub that got smacked on this astonishing body. Yeah. It, it, it the two do not go together. Well, it's just as bulky must. It's like it's like the Palaiuolo Battle of Ten Nude Men got smushed together, and then somebody put like seventeen thousand more muscles on them. It's just it's like <laughs> maximum. At the same time, look at that gorgeous sky. Yeah. It, and it shows the the ability to create very soft, wonderful detail as well. This certainly got the students. In this case, though, what you also see is that he's really starting to formulate his. Hatching, one of the things that Holtzius will do is it, nobody gets that swell and taper of a mark better than Holtzius, and he uses it to every possible effect. Putting the, the Buren in at the edge of a figure and having it arc across the thigh and give it almost this topographical arc, and it, it gets wider in the middle and swells and tapers at the end. And eventually, he gets this kind of cross-hatching, and he builds what we now start calling the dot and lozenge pattern, so that when these two fields of swells and tapers cross, they create these little diamond shapes. And to get that extra little zhuzh of, of shadow, he'll put a little dot in the middle of that. And, and it really is, it's a Holtzius technique. It's just really quite wonderful. Okay, so this is Holtzius pre-Italy. Oh, but wait, one more. <laughs> and I have to show this because this is one of my favorite things I ever got to do with <laughs> Anne. So wonderful. We love this so much. This was a whole cycle, a whole four images that were done after classical subject matter by Cornelius Cornelius of Harlem, that nice little for, soon to be Dutch city. And everybody knows them as the Four Disgracers. And they're an astonishing set of four circular engravings. When we first started teaching this class together, there were only three of the set of four in the BMA collection, but they're referred to as the four disgracers, and eventually, in 2013, there were four. Yeah, we, the, there's always a list of things that are just big hole, gaping holes in the collection, and if, you, if there's four of a thing and you only have three, you're always on the lookout for the fourth. And so my colleague, Rena Hoisington, and me and Ben Levy, who was our assistant at the time, were up in New York at the IFPDA print fair. <laughs> and one of the dealers had the fourth. Here's the thing. Well, he had all four, actually. Yeah, but here's the thing. So I'm all envious because I'm sitting in my stupid office in academic yes, advising because you guys are up at the print yeah, fair. That's what it and my phone rings like, <laughs> and <laughs> I hear this, academic advising, this is true. Hi. I'm at the print fair. Which of the four disgracers don't we have? I said, it's Phaeton. I said, okay. I said, why? Because there's one here. <laughs> and, like, and then we were whispering into the phone. It was so exciting. It was exciting. Yeah, because yeah. we had all of them except for Phaeton. And I and, and you called to ask me which one we didn't have. I said, how can you remember? Like, and it's Phaeton. It's the one we had missing. Oh, I know, but geez. it was so awesome. It was good. <laughs> so Anne got. Phaeton. Was the and of that one, but yeah, and called me, and we got happily, freaking happily. We got it, again. and nobody else got it before us. Ha! I've just always felt really pleased because then from then on, we could always pull out all, all four, four of them, yeah. and they're good size. They're at least eighteen inches across. The, yeah, the rounds are probably fourteen, maybe. Yeah, at least, and 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 they're stunning. Each of them is a circle around each, a circular plate around each of the circular plates is a whole ribbon of text engraved, of course. And as you, if you see them as the suite, all four of them, what's the first thing you notice? It's four individual nude men, all seen in falling positions. Two of them are, seem to be in daytime and two are in night or at least broiling, roiling skies of storm. And they are definitely male. Yes. And they are definitely in various states of falling, as in crazily contorted, not just straight down, not like diving with an arc in the back, but tumbling yes. through space. Yes. And I've never seen, frankly, the drawings by or what have you that that Cornelius Cornelius had supplied to Holtius, because all I am dazzled by is you got Tantalus, Icarus, Phaeton, and the, the grease eye drawings, 
I can't possibly, which are now lost. Yeah. Um, I can't possibly imagine what come anywhere near what these became. And so these tondos are lovely. And I think if you'd listened to us earlier, you'd understand that these fig- figures seem to be fairly Michelangelo-esque. Yeah. They've got all the bulginess that you would expect like of a Michelangelo Last Judgment. Mm-hmm. And yet this kind of flurry of color and bravura that one might have gotten from Titian. And mm-hmm. yet... Yeah. The thing I love best about these, aside from the fact that two seem to be in light and two seem to be in dark, is that they are really, I still think, it's it's believed that they could be, of course they are, they are veiled references to, there are four individuals who dared too much, and they tried to attempt to get, to, to have the powers of the Olympic gods and were punished for their hubris. And so in many ways, it's like the local pride of Harlem being able to expel anybody such as the Spanish or artists that were competing from Spain for the kind of quality of work that they could make. It's a great way of saying, we're better than y'all. Mm. It just pleases me. Yeah, Philip to the Spain, stay the hell out. We're going to punish you. So all of these, I didn't give you a close up here, Anne, but That's okay. the swirling marks, come on now. There, some thought that maybe these figures could have been done in their various positions by using wax models. And that's how Tintoretto actually set up some of his figures. But we're talking amazing foreshortening. Yes. Like, remarkable foreshortening. Like, right up to the man's scrotum. Thank you. Oh, I'm so proud of you. You said it. I did. You did. In fact, there's not just one. There's two different Scrotum's scrotum. Right, up right there. there. There's one in light and one in the dark. Yes. Okay. A little shocking. And that's a real attention grabber. It's going to keep your attention on it. (laughs) Let me see if I can keep them in order for you. Tantalus, I actually had plenty of cool notes on these, but Tantalus was, let's see, what did he do? I'll give you the translation just so you can get it. Seated amidst the waves, parched Tantalus suffers agonies of thirst. How miserable is he who lives in abject poverty in the midst of riches. No one should believe the favors of fortune bring happiness. They're good for good people and harm the wicked. Tantalus, the guy for whom was the source of the term tantalizing, was punished uh, by being forced to stand in a pool of water in hell for all time, and he'd get thirstier and thirstier, he'd try to, and the water would keep going up, 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 up to his neck, and then he'd try and put his face down and get some, and it, whoosh, it'd all vanish. So he's pictured there. We have Icarus, who with the melted wings tried to fly too close to the sun, and he's falling away. We have Ixion, and he is being thrown into a fiery pit, and then Phaeton, he actually wanted to use dad's chariot and screwed up and had an accident with it and blew it up. And so he's falling from heaven. And so if you look at the, you can see that he's falling away and, uh, and all the various bits of the horses and the mm-hmm. chariot are in bits. And dad's like, God damn it. And he yeah, punishes him and throwing him out. It's, they're so marvelous. And honestly, I will say to you, I've had many people ask me in terms of my own work, because I, my whole master's thesis was done on falling figures. Had I been looking at Holtius's four disgracers? And the fact of the matter is I didn't know about them yet. Oh, had I, whew, but just nobody makes this, is Moir, is that the, Moir, yeah. yeah, the way he gets these, the swells and tapers of these clouds and whatnot, it, it, what's so marvelous is that they almost defy being re- replicated in reproduction on a computer. It can't handle it. That's what I love about it. It's so well done that mere digital images can't capture the patterns that it sets of the zigs and the zags and the fire and the, all the brio of it. And yes, definitely two scrotums. Uh-huh. And, and even, a, yeah, a poop shoot. <laughs> but they're still Italian. It's this Greco-Roman, heavy-duty, classicizing thing. So thank you for those four disgracers, Holtius. And again, check the hands. Yes, yeah, right. Check the hands. So Holtius, at the ripe age of 32, was already wildly appreciated. By 1589, people know him. They know his work, and they may even know of his political leanings. And he is widely sought after by those with princely collections, and yet, as a, according to some, Holtius was not a, a content to rest on his laurels. So at the age of 32, I think that's quite advanced. You know, that's past journeyman. He's already essentially a master, right? He goes to Italy at the age of 32, and he has to go incognito. 
Now, I think there may be two reasons. He made a trip to Rome, and Van Mander, the, the Dutch art historian, in 1604, he says that he that Holtius had some kind of weird wasting disease, a mysterious wasting disease that, uh, this is so gross, that triggers fits of bloody vomiting. Oh, wow. And so he needed to take a trip to be cured of that. Huh. Well, no matter what, he needs to travel incognito because he's too well known, because he wants to do his drawings and not be noticed. And maybe I think it's because he's from up in that naughty area, the Harlem area, where I think it could have been like a Martin Luther being spotted en route, correct? Mm-hmm. Cole just even does sketches of the Michelangelo's Moses, the one that looks like, ah, and he strikes his knee, and it looks like uh, Charlton Heston and Moses, Moses, Moses. Yes, he sketches that, and he's mastered all of this Italianate sculpture. And he comes back. And one of the first engravings he does is this uh, Judgment of Midas, which we never showed the crew, but that's okay. Judgment of Midas? That's what this is. Not Judgment of Paris. No, it's a Judgment of Midas, but it makes me think of yes. Judgment of Paris. Absolutely. It's like he's trying to take on... Look at this. Hello. Yes, I know. Oh, you can't just say I know. They don't know what you know. <laughs> well, there's a bunch of interesting characters in amongst this Judgment of Midas, who seems to be standing in the middle with a halo on a violin. But on the far right, there's a satyr with little horns, and he's... And one extra long horn that's very definitely excited. Yeah, and his hand seems to be pointing right at <laughs> <laughs> It's Hultius, and it's this big. Yeah. Yeah, so we have many wonderful... So don't miss that. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a perfectly perfect example, again, of mannerist stuff. Anything for the long figures, the too many muscles, the marvelously rendered hands and feet. Now, one of my favorite art historians of all time, someone who I just think holds my attention as a writer, and in his wonderful show, The Power of Art, with Simon Shema, he is just, I think, hilarious. And good, really good. And so it's a power of art. Look it up on YouTube. It's really great. I'll show little squibbits of it for my students. And he has this wonderfully nasty delivery. And it's just so very British. Here's a great quote of his. I just had to read because it gives you exactly what you need to understand about mannerism. It says, Prince, like the standard bearer, advertised that Holtius was a master of what came to be called mannerism, the most peculiar of aesthetic fashions, born of an indifference to both classicism and naturalism. Its practitioners made paintings that were self-consciously visionary, histories crowded with loops of of ethereally elongated figures whose tiny heads, aloft giraffe necks, sprout from sinuously elastic torsos clad in strangely shedded garments that resemble a second flaking skin. The bodies turn, twist, bob, and drift among a serpentine line, disrupting the expectations of the beholder and keeping the traveling gaze in thrall. All the prescriptions of classical arts sternly laid down by Renaissance art writers since Alberti were exuberantly junked. Fixed point perspective, hard line contour, the integrity of narrative coherence within a contained picture space. Art now belonged to the mind, and the mind belonged to the metaphysical. Signor Plato. And it's just, yeah, it's these aloft giraffe necks. It's everything about this is so beautifully full of artifice. And so the judgment of Midas is here and everything he touches turns to gold. And it's just ridiculously beautiful. You can see how collectors would want this elaborate image for their collections. Mm. You can even see someone sprouting ass's ears right in front of the the pan creature that you were taking a little out of umbrage at. It's as though he picked up every possible trope he needed from Ethley. Oh, for me, it's too much. Like oh, I, of course it's too much. <laughs> it's totally mannerist. I just prefer to have a single figure on my wall. Indeed, I'll take a, a disgracer, disgracer any day. day. Okay. Any one of them, bunghole scrote or not. I, seriously, I think Phaeton really is quite, in many ways, it's the most delicious of them. This one is the Judgment of Midas, and I just wanted to read to you the subject matter is the, desi- the divine basis of great art which is a Neoplatonic philosophy. Remember, Plato was being brought back, and especially by the Medici, and then the whole love of things Italian, and let's get get our handle on all this uh, wonderful humanist thinking. King Midas, who's right here in front of Pan, who's with his extra pipe sticking out, that's 16 by 26 inches. Mm -hmm. 
That's huge. Yeah. So you're right about this image of uh, that Holtzius has engraved. It, the judgment of Midas, which it should remind you, I think, of the judgment of Paris, in, including the placement of the judge at a moment over there on the right-hand side, and much like the judgment of Paris, and it's this idea of, of weighing of, of what's important. But Midas, here's the deal. It's, the, it's a divine basis of great art, which uh, is a Neoplatonic philosophy the idea of Neoplatonism had started to become a big vogue in the 15th century in Florence. That's where the idea of bringing back the ideas of Plato and merging them with possible overtones into Christianity. That's what Botticelli's Birth of Venus is a perfect example of Neoplatonic thought. Okay. And so here we have with mannerism still trying to bring back our knowledge of such things. But I think it's interesting that this composition has a peculiar resemblance in a way to the Marc Antonio Raimondi, this being Holtzius' own image. But here's the judge. Timulus is judging this contest. And, and the idea is that King Midas, who is on the right-hand side, right in front of, of Pan with his pipe and his extra pipe pointing right at King Midas, King Midas enjoys Pan's pipes, and he's accompanied by the satyrs over here, better than Apollo and his music-making which is considered to be refined. And see the three muses right behind Apollo? Yes, this is the best music. And then right. all these other people are standing around. And so Midas is punished for his poor taste by growing donkey's ears. What? Yeah. yeah. So that's he's actively growing ears right there. It's like kings are stupid. Yeah. And, and you say, it seems so overblown, you'd much prefer to have a single figure, and I'm not going to deny that. But if we think about the scale of this, it is a painting. It's six, as you just looked up for me, because you're so kind, 16 inches tall by 26 inches wide. That's an enormous okay. copper plate, yeah. which means, and it tells you everything, like all the text, all of these emblems, all of these attributes for the, the kinds of collections that people are now growing, and they want a Holtius, you know, that's a big damn dealio. All the artificial poses, all of that good distortion, it's intellectual subject matter. So you say that you want a single pose. I'll give you one. How about this one here? Oh, I love this one. Now that's interesting. Did you tell me that you had coveted getting this for the collection as yeah, well? Yeah, the BMA's collection does not have, or maybe they do now, but it didn't when I was there. Wouldn't it, it be fun to compare the before and the after the yes. Italian trip of these Hercules? Yeah, this is the Farnese Hercules. That, that Holtzio saw when he was in Rome. And instead of showing him from the front, which is like, oh yeah, it's the Farnese Hercules, he shows him from <laughs> where? Behind. And a fine behind it is. It sure is. I lass, that's a fine behind. And in his nice crumpled hand, he's got the golden apples that he had uh, gotten from <laughs> his labor um, with the Hesperides. And he's very Herculean, and he's looking really resting. And I'm imagining that's probably the lion skin, since you can see little feeties hanging off oh, it. And yeah. that's probably his enormous club that he's leaning on too. Right. But now, tell me a couple of things that you are noticing. Why would you have wanted to get this for the collection? Other things. Well, it's such a funny composition. Like, to, ch to choose to do the Farnese Hercules from behind just seems so bizarre. But in Why? A, why? Yeah. Because if you're trying to portray a statue that's usually presented from the front, shouldn't you do the front view? Haven't you ever walked around to the backside well, of the David? Sure, yes, of course. But the other thing that I find so funny is that this is maybe the first time we've seen people looking at art. There's two little figures down in the lower right looking up at his... Enormity? His w wiener. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they're going, wow, isn't that big? How big is it? It's got to be an enormous sculpture, right? Mm -hmm. But these little people, their two faces are looking at the vast enormity of, of classical art. And their heads are half the size of one buttock. <laughs> and so the Farnese Hercules is indeed enormous, but it's so smart because... As you say, it's a picture of people looking at art. The sculpture is truly sculptural in this image, as mannered as it could possibly be, knowing that it is a, a stone sculpture. And it chip, 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 chip. And yet every muscle is there. All of those marvelous cultiest tidbits with the, the dots and lozenges and the, the noir kind of patterns of the sculpture, of the shadows. And, and then this delicious sky going on behind. And... He, he makes full use of the entire space. That's your single figure you wanted right there, right? Yeah. With two little guys watching him. Yeah. It, and it tells us everything about Holtius made this, and it really shows that he's arrived. And, and it, it shows his incredible originality. And yes, 
this is, of course, one of his most popular prints. This, it's not quite as big as the Judgment of Midas, but it's a little 16 and 7 sixteenths by a little, almost 12. That's a gigundo hunk of copper. Yeah. And, and it's, a great, it's a great format. It's so smart. Look yeah. at how well, and, and even the way he uses all of the lettering at the bottom that just grounds it. Yeah. Because otherwise it would just be floating, but even, you know, and it even says what it is here, uh, the carved into the stone. Well, there's a lot of white space, really. The tons, but look at how well he modulates it yeah. all the way up into the clouds. Right. There's just, it is intensely. It's a stunner. It is, and, and here he is, he's showing off. Okay, my notes here say it's a Roman sculpture by Glycon from the third century AD for the Baths of Caracalla in Rome. And again, a way to transmit the ideas of ancient Greece into Rome, into the current day, the whole mannerist thing. And so from behind and from below, and the anatomy and the lighting of this thing, it was an outdoor sculpture. Mm -hmm. Think about all of the decisions he made while sketching that. And then, by the way, incognito, he sketched it in Rome, and then he comes back and engraves a plate in Harlem. I'm telling you that that's kind of amazing. It's, I just looked up the price just to. I can I get it. Curious? No, I don't believe so. What's it's, out of my range? Hmm. In uh, 2017, it sold at auction for eighteen thousand dollars. About out of mine. Yeah. But I just found out something earlier today was only five. What was it? Three thirty-five euros. Something like that. Yeah, something I could get. See. Well, that's the fascinating thing with the market. Like there, there are certain works by certain people that go for big, big dollars, like the Farnese Hercules. But then, like the standard bearer, you can get for two twenty-five hundred. Or I'll, I'll have to look it up. But. Yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't sneeze at, at any Hultius. I don't any Hultius. Honestly, there's something we're not going to talk about, which is the fact that Hultius had also designed things that would become chiaroscuro woodcuts. Oh. We also had, and we never looked at those because there was too much to talk about with him just as an engraver. Right. But that's a whole nother chapter. But if you think about it, that in, in itself is also painterly because they're emulating washed drawings and whatnot. Okay, so here we have Hultius flexing his everything, showing how good he was, how smart he was by going to Italy. And the thing that we loved talking about was the Meisterstücke, the master engravings, the, the masterpieces. This is a set of six engravings that he had done in 1594, and they are also good sized. And each of these six engravings were done in a different artist's style, which shows the inventiveness of this artist, of Holtius, and his skills as an engraver. It tells us everything about what the taste was in its day, in his day and it also tells us something else about the artist which is that Carol van Mander in that Het Schilder book the the book of the artists in 1604 had praised him so highly for being able to be such a chameleon that he was masterful enough to be able to seem like these other artists that was a higher purpose than just being purely original I think that's super impressive. That's a fascinating. And here's a perfect example of this, because when we would pull out one of the six plates from the masterpieces, the Meisterstücke, we'd say, okay, who did this? And the students go, oh, blah. And you'd go ahead, Ian, tell them what I'm showing you. Yeah, so we've got up on the screen the Holtius of the Circumcision. <laughs> yeah. Next to a woodcut by Albert Durer of the same subject. From the life of the Virgin. Right. Now, it's also interesting because the life of the Virgin was a woodcut cycle, and this cycle of six Meister, but he's an engraver, he's not a woodcutter, but he's emulating Durer in yeah, engraving. Yeah. It's so smart. But the only thing, the, the way you probably would know that it's not Durer is by the scale. Yeah, the size of this copper plate is really something. Yeah, the, so 19 inches by thir 14. 19 by 14, is, that's a huge plate. It's now, big. Her it never goes bigger than then, like yeah, like, 8 by 10 or something. It's, it's just so fun to see these two together. He's managed to capture Durer's ability to render an interior, to capture light. In a way, it's got so much of that gorgeous light that we see from St. Jerome in his study, right? Mm -hmm. The way it's filtering through, that's an engraving. In this case, the circumcision in the temple, one would hope, and the Moyle is doing his job on the little Bubba Christ... <laughs> and that should make everybody squirm just a little bit. The whole crowd is gathered around this poor little baby getting snooped. Well, it's a brass, right? It certainly is. There's a little, ah, in the middle. <laughs> Look at how he's really got our, our attention, like, right to that. Yeah. 
the point of contact, shall we say. And, uh, and I am comparing it to the, the Durer circumcision, and it's so damn clever, if you think about it. Okay, so let's just parse out before our listeners, if you would, please, what you're seeing in the Chelsius, because it's just so darn fab. Yeah, it's um, the, the, the guy with the big old beard and the, I guess he's a priest, maybe? Yeah. Like holding the baby Jesus. Maybe wow. it's Joseph. Oh, geez, Could right. be a dad. Mm. He's old. He was old. Remember all those uh, annunciations? And then she's like, yeah, and he's so. like, oh, right. right. And then the guy doing the breasts, is he wearing glasses? Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He better be. He's, he's on a little stool in front of Christ, and he's about to do the, the deed. And then there's a group of people to the right sort of praying in somebody's backside. Yeah, in, in very contemporary dress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then on the left, there's his mom, Mama Mary. And, and she's like, really got her hands pointing right down there, like, guide, God guide his hands. Yeah. And, and and then other people in sort of 16th century garb. Well, look at that top hat. Look I that. know. Isn't that spectacular? And then this wonderful yeah, chandelier. We're in a church. And you know, this church is the interior of St. Bavo, in, Bavo. Yeah. yeah, in Harlem. Right. It's in the hometown church. And just the caliber of the engraving and the description of the figures, he's managed to suppress his all that scary mannerist bumpiness. Mm -hmm. And it really does look tremendously like Durer. It sure does. In fact, he even aged the paper on purpose to make it seem like You're Durer. Kidding. I sh shit what? you not. Yep, he did. Wow. He aged it and he tried to pass it off as a long lost Durer, oh, some sources yeah. say. Because by this time, by 1594, Durer is absolutely in the canon. You want Durer's in your Kammerstücke. You want your Kammer collection to have this. Now, what's the one other thing? What's the adorable trope that he gives of emulating Durer for this? He's got a tablet-ish thing center on the floor, right in the foreground with his monogram on it, which in, is very much... In, in an exact laid-down perspective of a tablet on the floor with the monogram, just like Durer's is laid down in the, in the Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome right. Smart, clever. And then there's one other way he signs it. That's the part I love best. Is there a self-portrait on this one? Oh, there he is. <laughs> he's I just, about that. Yeah, he's behind Joseph's shoulder going... Yeah, okay. And he's looking at us. Totally looking at us. Van Dyke mustache. Yes, totally. With his Van Dyke. And he's looking right at us like, yeah, I was there. I made that happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it kind of the way Raphael peeks out of the School of Athens. It's like, yeah, I saw that too. It's just as winsome as it can be. And then there are five others in the series, each of which emulates a different artist. And I just, that's really something to me. You know, how to prove that a northern engraver or an Italian painter, he's good at any of it. And he showed that boom, 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 boom. He's, he's totally flexing his muscles. So it's both rivalry and an homage, mm -hmm. which makes me so happy. And he signs it with a self-portrait. So there we have it. I actually had one other engraving I wanted to share with you. Again, where Hultius is able to combine, brilliantly combine so many different things. So we, here we have a Pieta, a lamentation of the Virgin over the dead body of Christ. And I would say to you that it really does seem like he's done it in the manner of Durer, yes? Mm -hmm. However, the pose is Michelangelo. Look at it, it's yes, the Pieta. It totally is. Well, how does he do that? Just help us out here, Anne. What makes it Hultius, though? Holtius, that's a good question. I, I get thrown off by the radiant lights. That's that totally of his own time. Create the halos. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. Mary's is a... A round one and his is a star. And what's also interesting, of course, is that the rays just go all the way out to the edges of the plate. You know what that looks like? Those James Sienna engravings of the No Man's Land. Oh my, Ben's going to love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, so if we were to show the Durer, it would just be the Virgin and, and you know Christ on her lap. If we were going to show you the Michelangelo, it would be just the Virgin, the sculpture of, of Christ on her lap. But here, Holtius has used the entire plate, and he's let the radiance of her circular halo go out to the edges. And Christ is now this star-like form. He's gone. And down in the lower left-hand corners, there are all kinds of little em emblems and ornaments and whatnot that uh, uh, tell the story. Holtius's uh, monogram is on a plaque lying, pointing right towards the body. And in the background, he also gives us that other vignette in a prior episode where the empty cross, he's been removed from the cross, and now he's in the Virgin's arms. 
And it has the tenderness, I think, of the sculpted Pieta, the Michelangelo one, which in its day was a 23-year-old should never have been able to carve that. No kidding. 23. Yeah. You know, and everybody goes, you couldn't possibly have carved that. And you know the whole story about how Michelangelo, yes, I did. And he snuck into the cathedral in the St. Peter's and went chip, 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 chip. And it's the only piece he ever signed, the ribbon across her mantle. Really? It says, yeah, it says Michelangelo Buonarotti made this. Oh. It was his beautiful flip in his finger at all those oh, people that believe that 23-year-old couldn't do it. But in this case, the pose is absolutely the Michelangelo, but the lines, the characterization, the tenderness, the proportions of the figures, all of that is the engraved equivalent of Durer. Yet this extra step of being able to dress all of those corners and show off, I can do these things, I can put together these big ideas and I'm, I'm all that in a bag of chips. So he's done it. It's this synthesis of the North and the South and his style, stylistic alternatives and he can put together the mystery of them and have them matter. Here's the part that it should bother you because it always bothered me. And so I'm a shame chalks it up to him figuring out how to get his engraving as painterly as it could possibly be. Huh. He had been hailed as the Proteus of Netherlandish art, the man who could do anything in any medium. He finally puts down his Buren and he never picks it up again in 1600 yeah. at the age of 42. He's I'm like, he's hungry. done, just stops. He puts it down, and yet he's a brilliant draftsman, as we know, and, and we could be looking at the catalog from the 2003 exhibition, which I didn't get to see at the Met, which is killing me, of course, but that was, you know, drawings and prints. But he puts down his Buren, and he becomes, he lets himself be the painter that he was striving to be. If you were to look at the array of prints that he had done, and all of the different voices that he could sing in, he can sing soprano, alto, tenor, bass, he can do all of it. He puts down his Buren, and he... Dan does a couple of things that I just really do want to share. The last one of which is the perfect statement of him. He, yes, he does paintings. In fact, he had done, what, 500 drawings, about 50 paintings, and some 160 individual prints or series of prints. Good gracious. 160, and with that hand, too. Yeah. But I love this, because this is the best coda ever. So here's a, what he called, what, a pen painting. He was doing these pen drawings with some light and heightening, and this is one from 1606. It's entitled, Without Ceres and Bacchus, Venus Will Freeze. And so without Ceres, which would be food, and without Bacchus, which is wine, Venus, love, or the artist, will freeze or die or, or become cold. And it's, what do you think of this pen painting here? It's amazing. How big is it, do you know? Yeah, it's good size. You know, it's probably about the size of a circumcision. But tell me what you're seeing. It's a beautiful brown ink drawing that features some very lovely mannerist if uh, there are those Cadillac bumper bullets again right there right? they are and look at the back of the woman whose back is toward us oh, which is really stunning I know I've seen that in another print by somebody else yeah and then is that pan on the lower right there oh yeah totally num 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 and then there's some Pluto up in the sky there on the they actually right yeah and left uh-huh and then it looks like a self portrait by golly, in that? the middle distance where somebody is trying to heat the little flames that'll help keep Venus or love alive is the artist himself, and he's holding two Burens. What? Yeah. Oh my God. I love the fact that he puts down his Burens and he takes up painting and um, just painting and drawing, but he's supposed to do one of himself as an engraver. I don't understand why he stopped. I do look they know? Well, Shema thinks it's because he had to turn himself to painting because he had gone as far as he could with engraving. And maybe he had. I think a guy who's 42, his eyes might be doing a certain thing. His hands might. I'm going to tell you, as somebody with these hands, maybe his hands are getting tired. Look at the right hand. Yeah. And maybe it's just time to paint. He was a brilliant painter, too. But look at him. He's just there with his little face looking at us like, see, I could do that, too. Yeah. You know, don't you wish you could have? And he stands up on his own. Our students absolutely adored him. How could yes, you not? Oh my God, exactly. Who, how, and, but it's so contrary to the 20th century. If you think about it, it's like, I can do this. I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. I can do that. And it's praised for his chameleon ability. But he was also so capable of being original, you know, with those compositions. And it's like, I can do this. And I think doing a masterpiece, a set of a six masterpiece engravings showing off I can do it like that. It's like the best of any art student being able to just, I've proven it. I got my master's. There I go. Right. Okay, I'm done here. I, I'm done. I've yeah. moved on. 
Are you quit at the top, right? Have you ever seen a dud of Chultius? <laughs> I don't believe I have. How could you? Why would a guy that has those kinds of things to contend with put out any duds? He totally wins. And at the same time, I still respect him so deeply for his principles of, of being a Dutchman. He's a man of the North. Yes, and yes, he went to Italy and he borrowed those things, but he is still a person of the North. It really shows us that Holland comes out on top. One last little tidbit. I love this so much. How the 20th century idea that painters and draftsmen or printmakers can't be of the same world. Again, I, I always say, I am now painter. And you know that. Right. I don't want to mush gooey gunk around on a canvas. I, I teach about it with great respect. But he proves that you could have those things. But get this. It was Peter Paul Rubens, of all people, who came to Holtius to visit him to ask who he could recommend for an engraver to replicate his, Rubens' own work. Oh. Yeah. And it's Holtius who says, you ought to try this guy named Lucas Forsterman. Huh. And he does. Huh. Which is also a very cool story. And Forsterman does an exquisite job yeah, of replicating he's... Rubens' work. We won't he's even... not as well known as he should be. Well, he did kind of go nuts and he did try to assassinate well, Rubens. So go. maybe there's a reason. <laughs> but anyway, no, right. that's another story for another yeah. day. <laughs> Such colorful characters. That's when you thought when you thought art history was <laughs> dull. Thought it was boring. <laughs> you fools. <laughs> Catch you next time. Oh my goodness. All right, folks. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much for joining us for episode 17 on my favorite engraver, Hedrick Holtzius. I'd like to thank True, as always, for being the fearless subject matter expert, the SME, as it were. I'd also like to send a special shout out to the crew over at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts print department, Nadine and Jennifer and everybody else. They have done a stellar job of getting really good images up online. And I would say that 90% of the images that I have posted throughout this entire situation are from the Met's website. So thank you. I also need to thank Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. And as I say frequently, the images that we talk about in the episode are available to you over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. We will see you next time.